uh, younger brother of the uh, artist, uh, and uh, I don't intend uh, to say anything further other than to uh, introduce uh, Richard DeMarco, uh, who uh, needs no introduction really in Scotland for his contribution to the arts, and he needs no introduction to my family because of the friendship and mentoring that he provided to my late sister in the early part of his career, and he would like to make uh, a few remarks. Um, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to do so. It's a great <coughs> honor for me to um, consider the art of this extraordinary young woman. She will remain always a young woman for me. Um, I remember her first when she was a student and then we got a wonderful photograph there uh, in one of the cases which you must look at with her uh, colleagues, uh, fellow students, and they're all studying graphic art. Now that's what I studied. Uh, I didn't want to become uh, one of those uh, people involved in uh, making masterpieces and paintings and all that. I wanted simply to be a graphic artist. People might be surprised to know that. I wanted to learn how to be a printmaker, uh, uh, how to be a mural painter, uh, how, to be, how to make art useful. I, I doubted the whole nonsense of people going to an art school to become famous artists. And I could see that all the painters were going to end up as school teachers. Because there was no job for a painter or an artist in the days when I was at art school. I went to the art school of Edinburgh in 1949. Like saying, I went and fought the First World War. <laughs> it was a different world, and um, I remember having great difficulty in getting into the building for the mobs of people, the queues of people were there, who were queuing up to get their food and clothing coupons. It was a time of rationing. Can you imagine? It was even before the time when the Edinburgh Festival came into being. But so many years later, in the 70s, I had a good fortune to be involved in, uh, to be working with a, a number of my friends, and we created something called the Travis Theatre. Hands up, anybody can remember the Travis Theatre. <laughs> oh, of course, gratified. So my life wasn't wasted. Uh, in the early days in particular, it was a very special place indeed. And um, it was the spirit of the Edinburgh Festival. It was there you could find that spirit in the 49 weeks when the festival had left Edinburgh. It, it had a kind of international uh, vibrancy. It was amazing. It became something called the Richard de Marco Gallery, when uh, it was obvious that they weren't taking, the people who took over the, the running of it weren't really um, as they should have been involved in visual art. And uh, so the de Marco Gallery was really the Travis uh, Gallery and theatre. And since then, uh, you might trying to work out why and if you're all here. Um, well, uh, all, all these years have passed since the 40s, and I still believe that the language of the visual artist is important. And you can have all the proof you need that it's important if you really spend time looking at this extraordinary girl's work. This young girl, so much promise, so much, so much uh, the spirit, the poetic spirit of the artist. She uh, and I, um, in a way, personified 
the kind of person who was being um, educated in, in, in the basic uh, needs uh, for anyone wanting to be an artist, graphic artist, muralist, printmaker, someone painting oil painting, sculptor, and you had a very simple, straightforward attitude. You didn't think of becoming famous, you didn't think of becoming rich, but you did think it was a very important, uh, how can I put it, um, ambition that you might have had to learn how to draw, to learn how to paint, to learn how to make your thoughts meaningful in visual terms. Now in Scotland, it, it, we live in a culture here in Britain and certainly in Scotland where the dominant means of expressing yourself is in the written word or the spoken word or to a certain extent of music. But the visual arts have always had a fairly hard time. And therefore, I, I was worried about this young woman with her talents, about how, as she decided to go back to Canada, where there's a very strong Canadian link with her, mm -hmm. um, although she loved this country, and she loved her, in, in particular, uh, Ayrshire, and in particular, little uh, dwelling place associated with a great poet, Robert Burns. It, uh, I'm referring to Alloway. There's a particularly beautiful image of Alloway um, as part of this exhibition. You can search out. Like all exhibitions, it's a hard thing for you to deal with. It's not like going to the theatre where you sit down and for two hours you're given um, something to think about, <coughs> a story or something. It's not like attending a concert in Russia Hall. No, no. You have a terrifying responsibility to really seriously use your eyes to read the messages that she's trying to share with you about her delight in colour. Now, colour is dominant in all our experiences of being alive. And I think I'm standing here at this table because I think this is a kind of self-portrait. If you look there, you see there's a, there's a head of a young girl, and there is the heel behind the shoulder. But really what she's dealing with is not just the physical reality of herself, anyone of her age, it's, it's about youth, and youthful exuberance, and youthful hopes, but it's also about colour as a means of expression. Of course, the great masters of colour, they dominate the history of art in the 20th century, I'm thinking of Matisse, uh, I'm thinking of practically all the great artists who took colour seriously. We are not educated in our primary, secondary, tertiary educational systems to know how to express ourselves in colour. You understand? Uh, we're taught to play the violin or the piano or whatever, but colour is a bit beyond us. So we should be grateful to this extraordinary artist to leave us such an extraordinary manifestation of her love for colour. But it's not just colour. If you look seriously at what you've got here, you'll find that she has a delight in aspects of nature and the human presence in relation to uh, the plant world, the animal kingdom, and the shape of a human being. It could be herself, it could be people who are going to be present.
question. But there you have another portal. And again, uh, the use of colour is extraordinary. Um, of course, I define myself as a watercolourist. And she is without doubt a watercolourist. You've got to take that on board. You've got to let everybody you know and you care about, every child, every one that you take seriously in your life, to come here and delight in the art of applying watercolour paint. If you, if you go up very close here, you will be amazed at the way she has um, transformed this piece of paper, this large piece of paper, which is a difficult piece of paper to deal with because of its scale. And it's no, it doesn't matter <coughs> which part of the paper you look at, uh, either this corner here, where she's paid great attention to making that corner um, different from that corner there and that corner there. And then dealing with this extraordinary um, intricate web of form transformed into pure colour. It's like a symphony. It's, uh, it's, it's like, I think of the music of Ravel. I think of um, all sorts of dreams that I have had, and I'm sure you have had, where colour is dominant, where memory is wrapped up in colour. So, most people can do without colour. They don't need it in their lives. I don't know. It never comes into the conversation. You know, you won't mention the word colour in the, the world of politicians. It's not going to be mentioned in that august chamber of the House of Commons. You don't mention it. They don't need it. And yet these people are running our lives. I think you've got to come here as an alternative to... Uh, the place where the conversation is uh, wall to wall uh, uh, to do with policy, political thinking. Here you have a different kind of thinking. But you've also got uh, her delight in drawing with a pen. So, I mean, again, this relates to my own love of using a pen. Uh, and many of these um, drawings are well worth your study, your consideration. I think it's important for the children who are being educated at the school she, um, where, where she was educated, and I'm thinking of the convent school at Kilgraston. I think you should make sure that the headmistress and the staff come here and that the children in particular, and especially those studying art, come here. Because this is not maybe providing us with proof that it was a good idea that she went to that school. But I think it was there that she learned how to express herself in uh, this way. I think this room and the other two rooms are something uh, to treasure. They won't be here for very long uh, because um, this exhibition ends all too soon. So you've got a big responsibility to return here and really study it. The other point I want to make is that she has um, drawn my attention and surely your attention to the uh, physical reality <coughs> of a box, any box, and she's taken great trouble to paint images of extraordinary variety on the lids of these boxes. Uh, I can see two of them, the side, uh, others in the other case. I think it would be well worth your while to take one of these boxes home, having paid 
<laughs> but there is a, a, another point. I think this whole exhibition should, or part of it, should go to the school as a, well, uh, as a means of inspiring the children. Maybe not enough of these children, like in many schools, uh, is the language of the visual artist taken seriously? Here it is taken seriously. And then I'm going to say to you uh, that I'm grateful to my friend who has made this building uh, into a space for artists. Uh, we all know it was a place given over to include the hospital for animals. Um, and this room in particular was a, uh, a room um, given over to uh, Polish uh, veterinary uh, medicine. Uh, I wonder what uh, the, the students of veterinary medicine who were Polish would have thought of this. I'm sure uh, they would have been delighted because in Poland, I've discovered, there's uh, more evidence of the visual art language being taken seriously. And I would like to say that we are fortunate to have a great patron of the arts here with us who converted this building um, miraculously uh, a few years ago into a place where artists can feel that they are at home. And I'm referring to uh, Robert McDowell Standing there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you wouldn't mind, I just like don't want to take up space, but I've had the privilege of really getting to know the work of Anne Marie Gilmore and facilitating this exhibition and having a super challenge of familiarising myself with all her works and how to hand them. And it was really um, challenging for me. I had to phone up my mum and go, Mum, do I just trust myself? And she went, yes. And I, the three different spaces have, are very different. Her work has many facets of different. And I'm, you all knew her, for I assume that you were contemporaries of Cecil and Marie. I just know her through this journey. And I'm quite moved, and it's been really lovely. Well, so thank, thank you, yeah. Robert. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> I just end by saying, you mustn't forget a great gift as an inspiring teacher. And it gave me great pleasure to introduce her and her art to the uh, people responsible for a very, very important art school in Montreal. Um, and through that introduction, she got the job, the responsibility of teaching. And it gave her great pleasure. So what you've got here is evidence of the, um, the artist as teacher. You can imagine her sharing her obvious delight in making art, expressing her, expressing her joy in, in being alive through art with her students. She was a highly successful teacher and much loved. And uh, you should know that I feel um, that I probably um, can feel grateful to that moment when I happened to be in Canada and I happened to be dealing with the people running that, that university to uh, uh, and I happened to say it's about time that you realise there's someone from Scotland living here who should be employed by you. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, caused, that caused her to be actively uh, totally, com completely committed to the business of sharing her art uh, with the students. Anyway, I would like to say that Bill 
Gilmore has done a fantastic job mm. too to mm. frame everything the way it's framed, to gather it all. And now we have the great uh, responsibility of experiencing this seriously um, and thinking of ways in which we uh, extend its reality uh, beyond here. And I think it, it should grace every wall, every corridor wall, every <coughs> room, especially the art room, that's all glass. The headmistress is not here, is she? The governors are not here. But it's more than the great violence necessary. I think we have to see every child in that school welcome here, to see uh, what the education at Kilbraston Common School can do for you. It can actually make you into the one thing that you're born to be, whether you like it or not. Everyone is born to be an artist. Everyone is born to be creative. Everyone is born to reveal the, the mystery of their life um, in some manifestation uh, of the art. She has chosen visual art language and she has left a great gift to all of us. We should be grateful to her life and to those who care for her and loved her and her family. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> the headmistress.